Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good morning, Rob. <clears throat> Good morning, Rob. Good morning. Good morning. Changing my view, gallery view. Is it doing that? So, did anybody catch the news today? <clears throat> well, which side of the state news? I think is the question. Well, no, the uh, interest, the stock market's crumbling. Interest rates are coming down. Yes, saw that. So I think um, we're gonna have a <clears throat> we're gonna have an opportunity coming up here, and um, this weekend, uh, I and probably most of our leadership team were inundated by <clears throat> everybody forgot how to do anything this week. Um, you know, forms, conversations, um, process. So here's an excellent time for us as team leaders to, you know, reinforce and um, kind of role play what we're doing. Uh, I was listening to, um, you know, one of Tom Ferry's uh, conversations. He actually was talking with uh, Tom Tool, and it's the first four months of the year. 1,111,000 of the NAR members did zero listings. Um, and I'm 60, and um, 325,000 did one to four, 45,000 did five to 10, 15,000, 11 to 20, 2,500, 21 to 30, 931 to 44, and 750 agents did. 45 or more listings in the first four months of the year. There's a lot of people doing zilch um, before the settlement. Um, it's possible that some of that zeros are people on teams, but probably not a significant amount. Um, if we're not role playing, well, first of all, if we don't have exactly how we've shifted for our conversations, then I really think we need to um, you know, play out, role play the process uh, in our own mind, have those conversations with our team members, because that will not only make us better, but it will, um, you know, it will leave a mark on how, how our team members are handling the conversation and the appointments. And I don't know, has anybody, you know, had any major changes in the structure or the content of your appointments? Um you know, in the past two weeks with the uh, changes going into effect. Most MLSs have pulled the compensation out. Um, I think everybody's talking about whether they need to compensate um, the agent or offer a concession. Any volunteers on, you know, how you've changed that process? Forms, <laughs> that's it. The rest so, is all so, stay the same. So, so the conversation that you're having, Glenn, is that, hey, you know, you've always had it as an option whether you want to pay somebody. And, you know, now we talk about how we compensate a buyer or a buyer's agent. Yep. Yeah. Um, and is that, is that the, is, I mean, can, can you put it in your words? Like if I was the seller and you get to the point of, you know, paperwork, right? Yeah. And compensation, how do you? How do you discuss what you earn? And then how do you discuss what you pay out if you don't mind sharing? Uh, what I say to them is, you know, I had this awesome $200,000 RV <clears throat> and I put it up on Facebook Marketplace and I got zero hits on it and zero serious people. Oh. And when I went and paid $250 to market it on RV Trader, all of a sudden I got active people that were qualified buyers that brought in the dollars. And I said, that said to me that, wow, there's really a lot to offering some more marketing dollars towards selling my home. And in turn, I get more activity and more people making offers on the home. And, and, I, and then I say to them, look, like, I know that there's news about this commission thing, but that news was the same when Reagan was president. It was the same when Clinton was president. I said, you always were able to do it. And what's in your best interest is getting the largest group and when you hit the market, you have the largest audience and you get one chance at a first impression. And that first impression is going to make you the dollars that you want. And then how do you um, talk about the magnitude of that? When you say the magnitude, what do you mean? I mean, you're putting out 2%, 3% buyer agent? Uh, it depends on who they are. 
Um, so a real and, and marketplace, right? If the marketplace is is doing it uh, historically at a two percent rate, I'll say to them, I think that a, an ample compensation is that. If it's not a market that does that, like if I went to Western Jersey, I get I get phone calls and hate mail uh, when, if I do it less than that. Um, so I'll explain to them that there are certain behaviors in certain marketplaces, and also tied to the property value. Gotcha. And then um, for for your commission, you always say, "Hey, my commission is that." Conversation is still the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I, my thing is, I just, I'm, I'm two and a half unwavering. I don't do three. I don't play the game. Um, I'm just two and a half. That's why I feel I'm fairly compensated at that. Okay. And I don't, and I keep that line consistent so that everyone <laughs> who talks about me knows that that's what it is. And, and did your team follow suit, or they're a little bit variable? Uh, I have a couple of agents that will do three percent, um, and they're, they're. Uh, their client base permits it, I guess you'd say, and I don't know how to put it any other way. Um, gotcha. And um, then there's ones that that feel that too is a appropriate compensation for themselves. So, and um, anybody else want to, you know, volunteer if you've been having these explicit conversations with your team members and and what that looks like. So I'll I'll just jump in, uh, Rob. Um, for us, I've been trying really hard to minimize the fact that there's a difference uh, in the sense that the the presentation should be just as it always was with the additional explanation of even though this is not a new thing, you were always allowed to uh, have this compensation model. It's come to the forefront of the industry now. Uh, and there are some requirements to make sure that everybody's aware of it. Aside from that conversation, um, I'd like them to understand that this is just a new way of doing business. It's not uh, really very different from what you always did. You have to show your value as a listing agent, and, and you have to um, do it in a way that... Uh, makes them feel comfortable that you're going to get the job done. I agree with Glenn a hundred percent. I think that, um, you know, showing your value and what you're doing for the, uh, you know, for the compensation is, is something that should have always been done. So. And, um, in terms of, um, commission rate, you know, do you, are you consistent personally with what you charge or does it depend? Yeah, on I've, you? Personally, I've tried to be uh, consistent across the board with uh, a, a minimum of two and a half percent. Um, I do take some threes. Um, having said that, again, like Glenn mentioned, you know, it really depends on where you're talking. You know, there are areas where, you know, if I had to do a two out, um, it would be a non-issue. And there are areas where if it's not a minimum of two and a half, they're, they're giving you hate mail. Um, so in that respect, I try to be consistent across the board. But in the office, we, we talk five plus. We don't, we try never to go below five unless it's necessary. And, and how are you dealing with your team members or how are you reconciling it yourself when you come across deals where they're paying out one and a half and they're keeping four? Well, I mean, that that obviously is uh, an issue, um, but that's where this new buyer agency scenario can make up for that. I mean, if you if you are working with a buyer and you say, look, this is what I get. Uh, and and you can show the value, I, I think it eliminates that as a concern. Right. I mean, um, I'll ask you two gentlemen or, or maybe, you know, Michael or Danielle on the call, if you had team members that got irritated because somebody took four, put out two, took three and a half, put out one and a half, and they're like, well, I want to do that now because it's not fair and they still got paid. I did all the work. I want to do the same thing. How are we communicating back to them that um, 
multiple wrongs don't make a right or how are we yeah because oh. you know, we had we had one where somebody walked away with a nineteen thousand dollar check our agent had an eight thousand dollar check and they were just you know um outraged and they're saying well maybe rob why shouldn't i do that when i have the listings and what does our esteemed leadership team say in that case well i, I can go ahead Oh, I was going to say, I can actually, I was in that situation where I took in four and gave out two. And at the closing table, an agent said to me, um, you know, what, you know, how'd you do that? Like, how did you, or why did you do that? And I said, well, you didn't, and this is the God's honest truth. Cause you never know what happens. The house was disgusting. It was an artist. It was like a hoarder house. So it took me months to help the seller who was handicapped out of state, get rid of his mom's house. I arranged everything from cleaning to junk removal, you know, everything to get the house ready, painters, carpet, because um, they weren't capable. So sometimes there's a lot of reasons behind that, but at least I can stand behind to say, you know, why, um, what, you know, what the reasoning was for that. I wasn't like grossly trying to be unfair. And, and um, you know, there there's equity and then there's business too, right? And mm -hmm. there's a balance between those two. Um, <clears throat> when, would, would it ever be beneficial to mention it before the closing? Probably not, right? Because then they're just going to try to fight you over it. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, uh, we always get, um, well, we're not always, but most of the time we get 6%. And we give two and a half away. That's that's um, the bottom. If we uh, we have to negotiate the two, three, and three, we'll do that. But um, mostly, we'll just give two and a half and keep three and a half for ourselves. I want to be fair to the other agents because they work hard too. But uh, being a listing agent, um, there's a lot more work to to be done. I mean, you got to prepare the sellers, the house appraisal, the inspections are a pain in the neck. And you got to work, you know, work all that out. It's a lot more work for the listing agent. Who's who is anyone seeing um, uh, buyer concessions instead of uh, uh, co-op commissions? Uh, not yet. Not hey, yet, Rob. Ron. Hey, Rob. Yes. Well, so uh, last night I had a conversation with one of my team members who had a listing appointment with the a family friend who's getting divorced. So, you know, wants to pay as least amount of commission as possible. Um, so uh, I basically told her, I said, we got to continue the way we've always done it. You know, my conversation was, you know, on the listing side, I charge 3%. How much do you want to pay the buyer's agent? You, you know, that was always my conversation. So I told her, continue, you, you know, the same conversation. Because, you know, now this person wants to pay out a total of 4%. So I said, okay, so tell him, you know, we're going to, we're going to keep two and a half and we're going to pay out one and a half to the buyer's agent. Now with the buyer's agent being able to get compensated right by their buyer and get this one and a half, I think we're still being fair, correct? Well, they're only going to get one or the other. So I think well, yeah, that, that, yeah. Yeah, and you can't, I mean, if you're getting a 4% listing, um, you have to really, I, I would split it 50-50 because that's not enough money for either one of us, at least two and a, two. And two. But um, so, so Ron, there, Ron, there's the equity piece, right? Then there's the business piece. And, you know, what the market's training some people is, to do, and I've seen this, uh, I've seen two transactions that our office has done. It was either... Um, five or six percent um, on each of them where they took that as the commission and they offered nothing out and they said you know um, you know all buyers reps have to be paid by their agent um, and I've seen I was, that on the, I was on the receiving end of that one of those <laughs> and I've seen that on the other side where our agents have been put into that position um, where the listing agents take in you know, three to six percent on their side and offering out zero. That's not, no. I, don't, I don't know. 
that's no, the exception. That's, that's not the rule, though, right? But no, it, right. It, I think that's wrong. Well, but is it, it is the exception, but it seems like, you know, we're put into a position where somebody who trusts the, the professional can say, oh, I'm only paying 5% and not realize that it's all going in my pocket. And when the buyer is paying their agent, that has to impact the way that they negotiate the price, right? I mean, they're not going to pay the same, theoretically. I mean, there might be an outlier, but... It, if somebody's going to pay, you know, 475 and they have to pay a commission, maybe they're lowering it to 460 and that's directly impacting the seller and enriching the listing agent, um, whether it's our agent or the, or the co-op agent, right? It, it, it's, it's an opportunity to take advantage of somebody who's, you know, trusting our advice. The very reason and, we have this it, lawsuit. Well, I'm sorry. They're the re they're the very reason we had the lawsuit in the first place. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if they're not describing to their seller what that means, they're not acting in their best interest. They're acting in their own pocket's best interest. They'll I I'm a believer they'll work their way out of the system. There's snakes in every place, but they'll work. The system will work them out of it. Let's put it that way. Wait wait yeah. till they're at a party. Wait till they're at a party and they tell someone that they paid their agent five to six just to list their property right is that is that eric pruitt on no it's charles rob no, no, I, no I hear you but i just see i don't know if eric's on as well hey, good morning rob how are you good morning how are you seeing it in the uh in your marketplace you know it's interesting i went to list the appointment on friday and um they'd already interviewed waterfront properties who's a big heavy hitter here in our luxury market and stuff and I asked them, did they mention anything about what's happening on August 17th? They said, no, what's happening on August 17th? And I said, okay. Uh, yeah, they, well, the Department of Justice has gotten involved in the real estate business now and that we are um, now have to disclose to buyer agents that they're going to be responsible for the professional fee if the seller's not willing to give a concession. And they're going like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> So everyone I've talked to about it thinks sellers have thinks it's stupid and they're willing to pay the buyer fee. Now, now, um, for, for, uh, I'm not announcing this yet because, um, the owner hasn't spoken to all of his agents, but I'm actually out here in, in Scottsdale. Um, we have a, another three offices out here. Um, and of course, when I go in there, I'm talking to the broker. He's like, Hey Rob, I need your advice. He said, in Scottsdale, the builders are getting to be a little bit nervous and they're paying out for sometimes 5% to a buyer's agent. Um, when we fill out a buyer's agency agreement, we're typically doing it at two and a half or three. Agent asks, can I have two buyer agency agreements, one for new construction and one for resale? And you know, we kind of brainstormed and we came to the conclusion that you could. I'm not sure that's going to past muster, but I think that's an interesting um, pivot that I hadn't thought about until it was raised. And, and you know, Central Jersey, Rob, there's not much new construction and they're not doing that. But certainly in Florida, maybe Virginia and in Arizona, the builders are getting very, very nervous. And maybe, well, there's, just... uh, maybe there's a base case too, uh, Rob, for uh, two separate agreements for two different types of purchases. Why, why do you have to have a separate agreement? Why can't it be part of the same agreement? If if we look at any new construction, it's going to be X. If we look at pre-existing homes, it's going to be Y. Or it could be all in the same agreement. I mean, you're looking at two different things. New construction, if you're talking to me here, could be a very difficult lift uh especially if they want a, a development style new construction that's that's a that's almost impossible to find why wouldn't you charge more for that hmm. uh, and then there may be other other caveats in that area that warrant it actually i think you probably outsmarted me i probably should have had them put the two the two different um uh, the two different types of purchases on one agreement. I mean, that's just what came to my mind. I mean, uh, maybe if I thought it through, I'd feel differently, but I I don't see why there's circumstances in every area um, that 
that would make you want to do things differently? I mean, down in Florida, maybe if you're in an area that is having this crisis with insurances, you you charge more because it's going to be more difficult. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there, but oh, um, I, mean, I, I mean, possibly a condo where you have a lot of issues with. Uh, you know, getting condos approved, getting buyers approved, things of that nature. But I did want to throw uh, one other thing out there regarding um, buyer's agent compensation. And I, I think um, it would be a good um, exercise for all of us. You know, we're, we're talking about what we're paying out, if we're paying out to a buyer's agent. And uh, deciding that, uh, let's just throw it out there, that 2% is considered a fair compensation. I, I think uh, when we start to look at these buyer agent agreements that come across with contracts, I think you're going to be shocked to see what value <laughs> those agents put on themselves. And I think you're going to see a lot of one percenters. I think you're going to see a lot of one and a half percenters because the average buyer's agent does not put enough value on what they do for a living. Uh, so I think you're going to be a little bit surprised at what you think as a listing agent is fair compensation and what they think as a buyer's agent is fair compensation. So, so Rob, I, I would say that there's a, there's a pivot to what you said, which is a lot of the buyer's agents don't have the value to command a higher price. So there, there's probably more of that than there are people who can't demonstrate or communicate their value prop. But exactly. I, I think, um, you know, um, for you, Eric, our builders are still paying higher commissions, right? In uh, South Florida. Correct. Yes. So, so this is a perfect solution that gets you the ability to get paid what you're worth. And um, when you're working with a, a non, you know, new construction home, you're not going to go to your client and say, hey, I need... You need, I need you to pay the difference, the extra one and a half percent of what people are offering out. Well, you know, you know, Rob, I was listening to a Tom Ferry thing the other day, and um, he said we need to do hurry up and do this before August 17th because it's all going away. He's having he's coaching his people, a number of them, to go in and look at the properties that pay two percent or one percent or no percent and compare it to the properties that pay two and a half or three percent or more percent and find out what the variable was between the average list of sales price and that anyone paying 2% or less, it was a lot greater than a half or 1%. And it's, you know, that, you know, real estate commissions are, they're an, they're an incentive to get the houses sold. I mean, they're a marketing tool. And if we're only paying one and a half or 2%, that house will not sell for as high as the price if you're offering two and a half or 3%. I firmly believe that. Right. I mean, I mean, sometimes though, like when you when you go too deep in it, it sounds to me almost on a on a defensive play. Well, you don't want to pay too little because then you give all the all the data. That's one way that could possibly you know come out. But then there are also people who are, you know, um, you know, spreadsheet number people. Um, but honestly, I bet you. Um, Eric, do you get much resistance on when you ask when you talk about how much you're going to pay out beforehand, before the change? No, right? No, because I always try to go for six percent, and I was always willing to split fifty fifty. So you I'm old school. Do. Okay, and uh, and Glenn, you probably never get resistance. Rob, you probably never get resistance on what you're offering out, right? No. Charlie, how about down by uh, Mercer County? Do you get resistance? No, no. Now, in fact, most of my existing listing agreements, when I had the conversation about the changes upcoming, they said, why wouldn't I want to pay a buyer's agent? Because I want to get maximum exposure and thus potentially the highest possible price. So most of the sellers get it. The situation with the, I did an open house this Sunday. I had a, did a two, two hour open house. I had 11 people come by and a buyer made a comment, which was enlightening. And he said, you know, in the past, buyer's agents were free. You know, they didn't cost me anything. I said, well, they kind of did because when you think about it, the commission was already built into the price of the home, right? The seller's agency was just paying for that commission, but you perceived it as being free to you. So 
So I think part of the issue here is somebody made a comment before, there's this legacy of buyers thinking that buyer agencies were giving their services away for free, when in fact they really weren't, they were getting paid at closing, but the buyers, you know, they don't necessarily read the HUD statements, they don't realize how much their buyer agent got. So I think part of this is legacy from the perception of buyers as having gotten free services in the past. So why are they now going to pay a buyer's agent two and a half to 3%? So it was interesting. Um, controlling the narrative, right? Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. And you have to educate. You know, when I did my open house, the way I did my open house is I only let one group of people in at a time. The rest queue up in the back and uh, outside, kind of like what we did at Clara Barton that time. And it yep. builds anticipation and people see people lining up in the community and they're wondering like, what the hell's going on? Why are all these people lined up in the walkway? So there were some times when I had four or five people waiting outside, lined up out to the parking lot. And then some would complain that they had to wait. But once they got in and I spent my 100% of my time with them while they were inside, they said, you know what? I would rather do it this way than, than having, um, you know, two sets, three sets, four sets of people walking around. There's no privacy, there's no attention to detail, um, et cetera. And it was interesting to find out many did were completely unaware of these new changes, effective 8-1 in New Jersey. Some had heard some things on national news but didn't understand it. And maybe one out of the 11 had a pretty good grasp of the situation. Um, so you do have to take the time during the open house to explain everything. Uh, to the people, and you have to explain to them, you know, you're the buyer's agent at that point. You have no agency relationship with them as buyers. Um, and then you have to explain that and find out if they do have an agent that's currently representing them. And then ask them, do you have a buyer's agency agreement with that buyer's agent? Because effective eight, one, you must. Um, and then you can get into the whole discussion of a disclosed dual agent versus a designated agent and how the listing agent can rep still represent the buyer. So it was, I enjoyed it. I think a lot of these calls that you've been having prepared me, you yeah, know, ahead of time. You. There's uh, a lot of confusion out there among a lot of agents. So, so it, it's, it's separation season right now, right? And eventually everybody's going to figure it out. So the quicker we have, the quicker we have our uh, process and our communication of the process down, you know, um, the better and the um, uh, more profitable our book of business will be. Yeah, and what was interesting about it, Rob, was I was able to develop instant credibility. And many of them asked me for my business card before leaving and said, you know, while I'm not ready to sign anything right now, I would like your business card because you really explain this very well in a very short period of time. So you can actually use it and leverage it, you know, as a, as a, uh, uh, an incentive for someone to want to do business with you versus you chasing them. Um, I was uh, listening to CNBC this morning and they said that there's FUD in the market. F U D. Yeah. Fear, uncertainty and doubt. Yep. And there's FUD in our market too. And um, the, the professional that clarifies that is going to win and they're going to get their unfair share of the, uh, of the market. And now, you know, I don't see like when markets, you know, kind of deteriorate like they're doing the past couple of days, you know, there's a, a run to certainty and mortgage backed securities and um, treasuries um, are very low risk. So there will be investors putting their money into mortgage-backed securities, thus lowering interest rates. And I think it's going to be in a, a pretty um, significant way in the short term. And that will create you know, opportunities for conversations. Okay. And a conversation doesn't always need to be so transparent as um, I need to know if you want to list your house, right? You know, if you say, hey, you know, uh, Charles, I, I, I just wanted to touch base. I know you bought about a year ago. Um, interest rates are probably down 1%. Have you thought about refinancing? You might say, well, I'm not a mortgage lender. Why the hell are you doing that? But they're, they're probably going to say one of two things. What, what do you think they might say, Charles? 
I'm sorry, I missed the question, Rob. I apologize. So if, they, if you call up a client and you say, hey, you, know, you bought a house a year and a half ago, um, I think your rate was in the high sevens. You know, rates are in the low sixes. Have you thought about refinancing? You know, they might say, no, I haven't. Um, do you have anybody you can you know, give them uh, advice to save some money? And there's that law of reciprocity. They'll probably keep you top of mind. Or they might say, you know, we're not, we don't really want to refinance because we're not planning on staying that long. Mm -hmm. Ding, 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 right? You win yep. either way, right? 100%. Because it looks like, you know, from their perspective, you haven't forgotten about them. It's another opportunity for you to continue to build a lifelong relationship with them. And it shows that you're acting in the capacity of an advisor, a strategic consultant, and added value, and you, and, you, and you care about them, 100%. Yep. So it's going to give us those opportunities. 100%, yep. So Rob, I, uh, I, ho I hosted two open houses yesterday. On the second one, uh, a person came in and we had some good dialogue. And <clears throat> I said to them, hey, I'm, I'm wrapping up the second one soon and my appointment canceled. If you want to go to a Starbucks, I can explain to you how I would represent you. So I went through my whole representation agreement. They signed it on the spot and I have an attachment to it, which covers, I think the list is kind of anemic in the buyer's agreement. So I created a 99 point list of things that we do as buyer's agents that gets attached to that document. I got a call about 8.30 at night from an agent who was irate that I stole her client. And I had said, do you have a buyer's representation agreement with them? And she said, no. I said, well, first of all, they didn't mention you. And there's only one of two reasons why they would do that. One, they didn't really consider you their agent. Or two, you didn't have a buyer's representation agreement. So she had said, I showed them two properties. And I said, well, they, they came into this one on their own. And I didn't coerce them. They went to a Starbucks and drove themselves to it to meet me. And uh, at the end of it, she said, okay, fine. Well, I'm okay with that. I'll let you have the client. Like she was letting me have the client. And then she said, could you send me the checklist? And I said, I normally share everything with everyone, but no. And I said, because my checklist is what I do for the client. It would be disingenuous for you to use that because clearly you don't. And that was the end of the conversation. Bravo. <laughs> yes. My but, I was, <laughs> but I was just laughing because I'm like, boy, how many people out there think that it's their client, right? I didn't steal them. All I did was educate them and and treated them like they were a client, even though they weren't yet, right? But the fact that they met me afterwards, I was just the the whole attitude of the person entitled to 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 represent them rather than earning them their business was crazy to me. And we're going to see this left and right, I'm sure. Right, but that that's the opportunity though that we need to um, instill in our team members, okay? Because look at if you have ten team members, you have one or five that have different levels of uh fun right yeah nobody nobody's you know nobody is fully uh absorbed on this and and um mastered the community not everybody on your team could possibly have mastered the conversation um so uh you know glenn you know this is why i like team member team leaders that are still in production because then you can relate these stories back to your team members um before I wrap it up, are there, and this is just for my own curiosity, are there any um, listings where you're seeing the commission being converted to a offering of a uh, seller concession for a buyer or buyer's agent? Or I have buyer? two. two right now. These are yours or that you've seen? Uh, that I'm on the other side of, on the buy side. Okay. Are they, are they the same brokerage or are they just random? Uh, just random. Okay. And I totally screwed up the forms. <laughs> I, I've been wrestling with the forms all weekend. I totally missed a form, messed up before, you name it. So um, I, I now have learned through experience, but it is some journey. But you, but you're obviously your buyer's agency agreement will protect you, right? It will. I just like to present a really professional package. And I did not feel like I did that on these. We won, but. Okay. So, um, so outside of Glenn, has anybody else seen more than one of them in your, uh, in your travels down in Florida? Anybody? Hey, Rob, it's Foss. We actually had to, um, do one in Wellington, uh, village of Wellington because the days on the market were a little bit long and the seller was getting antsy. So, uh, the seller, uh, decided they wanted to <laughs> offer something to on the buy side at closing. So we did it last week and we got two offers. 
And did you remove the commission and you change it to a concession or did you do both? So we didn't remove it because the MLS removed that slot. So it was already removed. Um, and then we just changed it on uh, the broker remarks. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, I appreciate you all hopping on here. I think it, it's thought provoking as this change happens. And if nothing else, if, if uh, the markets play out like they look like they're going to do, um, we can start talking to our our clients and and controlling the narrative for the buyers about interest rates dropping and and um, how that can benefit them. You know, because on a on a typical loan, you know, if it was twenty two hundred, you know, a week ago, it's now two thousand. It's a pretty big difference. You know, and and if you're looking at what that can buy you more. Yeah, you know, maybe a four hundred thousand dollar purchase is now four fifty. Same same uh, expense. Appreciate you all. Um, I'll see you on Friday and uh, again next Monday. Have a great Thank week, everybody. Thanks, Rob. Bye bye. Take care, Rob. Bye bye.